Good afternoon. My name is Linda Pantel, and I'm thrilled that you are joining us for Campaign Strategy today. This webinar will be recorded, and I will be sharing the link at the end of the presentation. I am thrilled to present our host today, Heather Booth. She's the leading strategist for progressive issues and, and electoral campaigning. And it is my pleasure to hand over the controls to Heather today. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, and, uh, and thank you to the University of Chicago. I learned so much there that has indirectly but fundamentally uh, shaped my approach to a life in building social change movements and developing campaign strategies. It taught me rigor of thinking. It taught me uh, curiosity. Uh, it taught me a breadth of knowledge that I've been able to use in many different ways, even though it wasn't specific coursework that I found I apply as I work on social change. And I want to thank all of you in the audience uh, for having an interest in this program. Uh, Linda, can you tell me uh, how many people uh, are tuned in right now? Right now we have 20 people. Great. Well, wonderful to connect with you all. Um, today's session, and, and again, Linda, thank you for organizing me into this session. The way the session will go is I'll spend uh, about a half hour telling my life story, or a piece of it, uh, that describes a life in social change organizing, progressive social change organizing, or some aspects of it. So you get a feel for what this work might entail with a number of different stories. And then we'll have the last half hour uh, to take your questions, comments, and specific suggestions on, if you're interested in getting into this work, how you might proceed. Before we start, uh, Linda, there were a couple of questions that we were going to ask uh, the group, and if they can, if you can explain to them how they can uh, report their uh, answers so we can get a sense of who's out there. Um, the first one was, have any of you been involved in any social change organizing so far? And Linda, to do that, what, what do people do to uh, report well, on that? Yes, the, the poll has popped up and our responses are already coming in. It looks like we have 50% of attendees have been involved in social change work. Oh, 60%. 20% uh, have not and 20% are unsure. Okay, well, uh, we're, we're glad you have an interest at whatever stage you are, uh, whether experienced or just new or just exploring, is this a field for you? Uh, when I was in college, I had no idea. I think I wanted to be a teacher or a social worker or a sociologist or a psychologist or many different things. I had a double major. Um, but once I was out in the real world, I realized that I loved people, hated injustice, and I saw that if we organize, we can change the world. Maybe one last question before we start, and that is, if there was an organization that you were involved with, or an issue, or a concern you worked on, can you just list what that is? Put the one word that might explain it. And then Linda is going to read some of those. Yes, yeah, so you can write those into that questions panel. So we have a couple things coming in. We have working with uh, Planned Parenthood on reproductive rights. We have some support of ACLU. Oh, great. Some immigration rights, oh, environmental yes. justice. Well, this gives a good, it's an array of the kinds of work, and yet it's all part of changing the world to make it better. And with that, I'll begin my own uh, comments. My real lesson out of this life in organizing is that if we organize, we can change the world, but only if we organize. 
I started my uh, work in social change in the civil rights movement, really in 1960, when I worked in support of the sit-ins, uh, which were demonstrating against Woolworths, a group that's like Target now, uh, that wouldn't let African Americans sit at the lunch counters in the South, and many of you have probably heard about it. And in 1964, I went to Mississippi in what was called the Freedom Summer Project. There were terrible conditions facing poor black people in Mississippi, but it was very hard to organize just within the, their own state because they so lived in a state of terror that they decided to bring down uh, from the north students from northern colleges. I was a student at the University of Chicago and were brought down after training to Mississippi. Many of you may have heard about the project because it was during that summer that three of the young volunteers, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, were taken by the Klan and were murdered. What you may not know is while the, they were looking for the three young men, they found the bodies of eight other black men whose hands had been bound or feet were chopped off, some thrown into different rivers in Mississippi. And those murders were never even investigated when the bodies were found. And the disappearances hadn't been reported because poor black people lived in such a state of terror. This is a picture of me uh, doing a voter registration drive, just registering people to vote. And we were picked up, and it was the first arrest I had. That's in Shaw, Mississippi. And here I am at 18. Uh, playing guitar in front of Fannie Lou Hamer's house, a great heroine of the civil rights movement and the co-chair of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And because people organized in Mississippi and with Northern support and with support around the country and going door to door and with heroines like Fannie Lou Hamer and combining the issues and elections, over time, within a year, there was a Voting Rights Act and Mississippi now is more African-American elected officials than any other state in the country. We still have much further to go. These are pictures of people who've been, been killed at the hands of police while they were unarmed. Freddie Gray, Trayvon Martin. We still have much further to go, but we make progress when we organize, even in terror conditions. I came back to my campus in 1970, the women's movement really burst forth, but in 1965, back on my campus, back at the University of Chicago, a friend of mine had been raped at knife point in her bed in off-campus housing on 63rd Street. And she was, we went with her to student health to get a gynecological exam. We were told gynecological exams weren't covered by student health, and she was given a lecture on her promiscuity. We sat with her. We had learned from the civil rights movement. And over time, of course, women can get gynecological coverage at the University of Chicago and at any place in the country because people organize, but only because we organize. We only make that advance when people gather together. This is a picture from a movie. Uh, the, the saying on it is, telling the truth is very revolutionary. And even speaking the truth is a way to stand up and build movement, helping people tell their own story. This is from a movie called uh, She's Beautiful When She's Angry. Um, and here's a picture of me with two young kids. I'm now going to tell a story of uh, when I was organizing within the women's movement uh, for a child care fight and give you a sense of what organizing involves. I was a young mother. I actually was still going to graduate school at the university in educational psychology, and I had decided to also return to work. Um, but in order to do that, I needed child care for my kids, and there was no city-funded child care. So we decided to set up a child care center. But the licensing codes were so restrictive, we went to 32 different city agencies, and then back to the first, not even having gotten a permit from any one of them. And it really wasn't designed to make child care accessible. So we decided to organize. This is a picture of me with my oldest son, uh, now much older. Uh, and we set up an organization called the Action Committee for Decent Child Care. Uh, and an organizer creates organizations. 
we then went around the city and in places where we uh, had support, like Hyde Park, and places where we didn't have support, like on the southwest side of Chicago. In one of those hearings, a right-wing group uh, was brought by an alderman. It's sort of like the alt-right of today. It was a John Birch Society. And he attacked us and said, aren't any of you good mothers? Don't, know, don't any of you know how to take care of your kids? It was pretty frightening. And one of the women found her voice. We had worked with her as a growing leader. And she said, you know, I am a good mother, but my husband was killed in Vietnam. I need to work, but to work I need child care. With that, the audience came to life and everyone had a story to tell. So part of what an organizer does is helping people find their voice, tell their story. We then brought the issue to people in City Hall. They agreed to hold hearings around the city. Each place we held a hearing in all 50 wards of the city. We were able to build a base that then could convince those aldermen, those city council people. And within a year, we revised the child care licensing rules. We created a uh, community-based panel of uh, parents and child care providers that would design child care licensing in the future. And we won $1 million for child care when a $1 million was real money. It's an example of one victory in organizing. I then became a labor organizer. In 1968, many of you have heard that Dr. King was called down to a strike of sanitation workers in Memphis. And next year will be the 50th anniversary of the Memphis strike. All the sanitation workers were uh, black men and their supervisors were white men. They were told they couldn't leave the truck even in the Memphis storms. And during a terrible thunderstorm, they went into the back maw of a truck. You know, in the, a garbage truck, it has that big back part where the garbage is compacted. They went into the truck. There was an unprotected lever. Someone slipped on the lever and they were crushed. They went to management and asked for a union and dignity on the job and decent conditions and protection. And they were told no. They went out on strike. This is a picture of the strike. Dr. King came down and was killed. There's often been a relationship between the civil rights struggles and movement struggles and labor struggles. And the struggles continue. Here's the fight for 15. This one, I'm not sure where this is from, but it's certainly going on in Chicago. And we know there's pushback on labor rights too. This is a picture of Governor Walker in Wisconsin signing a bill that undermines collective bargaining and the right for people to have a voice at work. But we make progress when we organize. With money I won from a back pay suit, I started a training center in Chicago called Midwest Academy. It's a great place to learn about organizing. They have five day sessions and sessions of different lengths. You, the website is www.midwestacademy.com and it's trained really thousands and thousands of organizers from many of the groups you described, Planned Parenthood, ACLU, many of the Sierra Club uses the training uh, and many, many other groups, NAACP and national groups and small groups you may not have heard of. There are three principles to the organizing we teach. One is that based on our values, you want to win real improvements in people's lives and make people's lives better. That it's in addition to justice and freedom and democracy, which are all important, you also have to put money in people's pockets, have air they can breathe, have health care they can afford, so that people know why the struggle is worth it for their effort. The second principle is we try to give people a sense of their own power so that it's not someone else giving them something, though we're for people receiving whatever they can get, whether it's from a mayor or a university or an administration or an elected official. Um, it's that people organize, find their voice, make their demands, and together they win those improvements. And the third is we when structural reforms, we build our power and we increase accountability on those with 
unaccountable power currently. And so we build organization and look for changes that will lead to greater changes in the future. On immigration, and this is the last example I'll give, and we'll open it up shortly. I say from 1492 to 2017 to this year, because as long as there have been immigrants in this country, there's been a struggle around immigration. And that's true for every issue. It's often hard to know when it starts, and the struggle usually just continues. I was the strategic advisor for the immigration reform campaign and also was the uh, coordinator for one of the first large immigration reform efforts called the uh, Campaign for Comprehensive Immigration Reform. And then I had worked for the Alliance for Citizenship. This is a beautiful march, again, with the flags and symbols of America. We are America, speaking to all of America as well as those people who are in the demonstration. And because of the strategies used, by those in the immigration reform movement. When I first started working on the issue, perhaps 30% of the country would say we were for a pathway to citizenship. And now that figure is nearly 70%. And people want us to be a welcoming country. Now the laws currently, there's a pushback and a restriction increasing. And people still face threat and families being separated. But we make progress when we organize. Here's a picture of an immigration arrest a couple of years ago um, that actually, uh, this was in, in, included uh, many members of Congress, clergy, uh, and other prominent leaders, and it gained enough attention because of the visibility, because organizing often includes how we get our message out and uh, getting it to the press. Partly because of this, attitudes have changed so substantially. So I come back to this message that if we organize, we can change the world. But only if we organize. It's a reason that I've chosen this as a profession. It's what I do with my life now. I've run many large-scale campaigns. I ran the campaign for financial reform that won the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Then again, there are pushbacks on it. There's a fight going on right now. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is leading a demonstration on the mall later today uh, in DC um, over the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And that uh, has returned nearly $12 billion to people that they otherwise would have been defrauded out of by unsavory um, uh, consumer practices. I ran the campaign around the Supreme Court decision on marriage equality. I ran part of a campaign on uh, Social Security to prevent privatization. Um, I was heavily involved in, uh, uh, with Planned Parenthood, as you, uh, someone said that you were involved with that. I was a coordinator of one of the large national gatherings on um, a March for Women's Lives. And basically, uh, if there's a large-scale campaign effort, issue campaign, I may have been involved in it in some way. Right now, you, I think on your camera, you can see behind me, there are signs that say, don't cut education to give tax breaks to the rich. And that's because I'm now the national field director for Americans for Tax Fairness, which is helping to lead the campaign against the uh, tax cuts that are now going through the Senate and through the Congress that would give enormous tax cuts to millionaires, billionaires, and the large corporations. Um, and it would be paid for by cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, education, and so much else that makes our life more civilized now. So uh, I've also been involved in um, election campaigns, and from uh, 1993 to 98, uh, was working at the National Democratic Party, uh, first helping to set up a field effort, and then as their training director, and have been involved in a number of campaigns around the country, including working for Mayor Washington in Chicago uh, and other, other candidates. Um, so I see that there's a connection between elections and the issues we care about, 
mostly motivated by the values that bring us to this work. For those considering this work, um, I'd say that the qualities that are particularly helpful if you want to do this work, one, are your values to hate injustice and to love people. Uh, you need that to do this work. Um, you need to want to build a relationship with people and not just look at it as transactional relationships, but actually caring about people, knowing when their birthday is, how they're feeling, um, and enjoying that. I'd also say it's important to understand people's interests, to understand that people do things for their own reasons. And we may go into a conversation wanting to recruit them to something we want to do, but the real issue is what do they want to do? And so a big part of organizing is listening, hearing what people say. What are they interested in? Why are they doing what they were doing? Why might we do things together? But I'd also say another quality is understanding power relations, feeling that we are stronger together and realizing that we are organizing to gain power in this world. So those without a voice have a voice. Those without confidence gain confidence. And I find even in organizing, I gain confidence as I continue with this work, probably having more confidence in all of us together than I even may have on my own. The last thing I'll share before we open up is that there are also places to go if you're interested in doing this work. Mostly I think people should follow their passion and the issue you work on or issues and the kind of organizing you do should be on those areas where you feel intensely about it. There was some ACLU and civil liberties, someone said, Planned Parenthood, women's right to their own decision about when or whether to have a child and for women's health, it being the largest healthcare provider for women in the country. Those just being two examples, but follow where you have a passion. I often find I like to work on the issues where I think there's the greatest opening for the greatest number of people to make the greatest progress at any point. But different people may choose for different reasons. The second thing is there are places to go that help you find these kinds of jobs. One is uh, to go to the organizations themselves and even do an informational interview or volunteer with the organization and express an interest in working full time for it and seeing if there are jobs that are open. If you want to know about kinds of jobs that are open, there are often in states multi-issue organizations and coordinating groups of social change organizations. In the electoral arena, there's a nonpartisan grouping called State Voices, and it's the alliance of groups that have field efforts on the ground organizing across issue, it could be Planned Parenthood or ACLU or NAACP or Sierra Club, um, and they all join together for the shared work that they'll do in a nonpartisan way during elections. There's another group called America Votes, and that does partisan work on the ground in the same kind of way, but for particular candidates in what's called an independent expenditure, not coordinating with the campaign. There are, of course, party structures, and then there are, and getting involved in a campaign, an election campaign, is a great way to learn some of the skills, techniques, and networks that can help you find another job. There also are some places that do uh, job searches, and you can find jobs posted. There's a site called Union Jobs. There's one called Jobs That Are Left. There's a website called an organization called Democratic Gain, G-A-I-N, and it's a, a kind of a professional association 
of people who want to be organizers, either in elections or on issues. Emily's List has many campaign jobs, as do the political parties. And for those interested in coming to DC, there's an organization called WIN, Women's Information Network. And it is designed for young pro-choice Democratic women in the DC area. I realize there are men and women in the audience and we're interested in all of your work uh, in social change. But those are some ways to think about starting your search, getting into the field. And with that, and with about a half hour to go, maybe we should open it up and hear your questions, comments, and suggestions about getting involved in organizing and campaigns on issues or elections. Thank you so much. We are changing the world. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful talk about, about your work. Um, please continue to send in your questions. We do have a few already. Uh, Heather, you have obviously been campaigning and working in the political organizing social change arena for a long time now. Can you speak to how that process has changed uh, as technology has improved and morphed and what that means uh, for organizing now? Well, some of the changes are so apparent, including doing something like this webinar, which actually didn't exist when I was in college. Um, but even what it means to have an online world. Today, for example, um, uh, actually tomorrow, Move On is having a, an, an, a national day of action on the tax issue. Uh, Indivisible had one uh, on Monday, yesterday and Organizing for America has one today. There's a grad student workout, uh, walkout uh, because grad students are gonna be particularly impacted and others. And all that was done with online organizing primarily. So that the breadth, the speed, the uh, some of the immediacy of organizing can be brought to such a broader audience because we have these new tools. And yet, the basic principles of organizing, I think, have not fundamentally changed. We do need online and on the ground. We won't show our power if it is just uh, clicktivism, clicktivism, activism on, online. If we just are sending in our petitions, that's important. It says a certain number. It's particularly important for getting the names of people and their geography, their zip code of where they live, so you can link people together. But the impact that you'll have for real power change, that's more likely to be made when people move from the online world to the on the ground world and doing both in concert together. And that's where the building of relationships, the understanding of people's shared interests, and the organizing to actually have power and change conditions comes in strongest with that combination. Whoever asked the question, do you have another uh, thought yourself you'd want to share? Uh, we don't have another written response to that one, but we did get another question about uh, managing uh, self-care and in, in an era where social change is uh, very, very necessary and important and consumes a lot of vital energy, how do you uh, keep yourself sane in this climate? I love that question. Um, I decided early on I wanted to be a long distance runner. This wasn't just a sprint, though any one time can be very intense. Um, and so just an example in my own life, I'm in two book clubs. One was a women's book club that's gone on now for about 20 years and we treat each other really as sisters. It's partly for the socializing, but also the reading. And then my husband wanted to be in it. And so we joined a different book club uh, that his college initiated and uh, we're, it, we have a theater series. We actually have two theater series. One, we go with some friends, and about once a month, 
we'll go to plays and uh, we spend time in things we care about and enjoy in addition to the organizing work. In our life, we have, I have five grandkids. They are the joy of my life. And no matter what intensity of work, I see them for a long weekend. They live in a different city, in different cities. Uh, every, every month, it's part of my agreement in doing this work. So the broad principles for me, I think, for surviving for the long run in this work, one, the first really is to love what you do. If you don't love it, I think if you have the option, you should change what you're doing. Now, there may be moments where you say, I'm too hot, I'm too cold, I'm too tired, I don't want to do it today, it's too much, it's too hard. <laughs> there are days like that. But it's different from feeling uh, this isn't the work you really love and want to do. Secondly, I think we have to treat each other with dignity and respect and be in organizations that care for each other. Uh, today, I just brought chocolates for everyone <laughs> working with me now because it's this intense week on uh, the tax fight, and I just appreciate everyone's work. Everyone is doing such a good job. So we have to say that to each other and recognize each other. We also have to share honest criticism. When something is not working, we have to say, this isn't what I thought it should be. Let's discuss it. What did you think it should be? Here's what I think it should be. So it's not dictatorial, but it is a sharing of what we need to do to improve our work. And then one area, uh, in addition to the personal self-care and being involved in things that we love in addition to the organizing, one additional thing I believe is having a strategic plan, a sense of where we are going and what the steps are to get there. Because if every day you're just slamming away, doing whatever's needed for that day, but not seeing the overall picture, you won't be able to see how you're making progress even when you may not win all the time. In Mississippi, things seem so daunting. It was not clear we could win, but we did because we kept organizing. On child care, everything seemed stacked against us, including the most powerful mayor in the country at that point. But we won because we kept organizing. On immigration reform, which I shared those slides, we haven't won yet, but I do believe it's a question of when, not if, because people continue to organize tying the issues and elections. So I think all of those, I treat them as part of the self-care and the surviving for the long run. Whoever asked the question, are there other hints that you might want to share? We don't have any responses to that one yet. Please continue to uh, to bring in your questions. This is an excellent conversation. Thank you, Heather. Uh, we and have if, one. If there, if there are more questions, I'm glad to take them. And if not, there are some other things I can also talk about or share. But next question. Excellent. Uh, as a, a you know, an individual with a long history in the progressive movement, what is your uh, opinion on the health of progressive causes, the progressive movement in America as it stands now? You know, before I answer that, I'd like to ask all of you another question. And that is, what do you think, if you had one word to describe the health of, why don't we take first the health and direction of this country what would you say? And then I'll ask a second question about what you think about the health of the movement. In other words, uh, taking the same question I was asked, and then I'll be glad to comment. One word to describe the health of the country, and the other, we'll do that one first. You can use the questions box to respond to this. 
one word to say what you think about the health of the country. Any answers? I'm seeing a partisanship. I'm seeing cynical. I'm seeing divided. Yes. Polarized. They all have a common theme. <laughs> um, and then for the health of the progressive movement, which I think was the question. Is that right? Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Okay. What a uh, one word to say the health of the progressive movement in the country. Are there some answers to that? They are coming in. I am seeing uh, mobilized. Yes. Seeing uh, young people. Yes. I'm seeing. Uh, uh, this is sort of a, a compound word, but a uh, looking for a leader. Uh huh. Okay. Um, well, then to take all of those, I I share the sense of all the answers. Um, I think this is both an incredibly perilous time and an inspiring time. I think it's perilous because inequality will grow, rights will be denied, hardship will increase for the many, disparities between the many and the few will increase, families will be divided. And so I find it a perilous time. Every day I wake up and I'm amazed at one more awful thing. Are we really heading to World War III? Are we really, are we going to do that? Uh, whatever the issue seems to be that day. At the same time, I really am inspired by the movements that have been developing. And as one person said, as it's mobilized, that there's often young leadership from Black Lives Matter to um, uh, the Fight for 15 to the Dreamers. These are movements led by young people. And there's also an alliance developing between older people like myself and younger people. And I find that quite gratifying and hopeful. Uh, when I was young, younger, there were there were um, you know there was a phrase at one point uh, not to trust people who were older. Don't trust anyone over 30. Someone said. I'm not sure if you ever really believed that. Um, and now there's an alliance between young and old um, in shared efforts. It's not in enough places. It's not broad enough. It's not deep enough. It's not strong enough. But it's emerging, and I do think it is inspiring. So on the health of the movement, I guess I find the two words that it's both this time of peril and inspiration. Um, there are many things people are learning together. I think there are strands of absolutism that are the basis for divisions often and I think those are troubling of saying I'm the only one that's right and no one else is right you're totally wrong and then fighting within ourselves and not looking to what we need to do to build a stronger movement overall so that's what I think about the health of the movement now and I one other thing I'd say, for those who, who wake up and wonder, how can I go on in this time of such peril, of such cynicism, division, uh, the very words you were using, partisanship, 
one way I find to go on and that allows me to stay hopeful most of the time is by putting my energies into organizing and making a difference. Then I feel I can be part of something that's larger than myself and leaving a legacy for others and leaving this a better world. So it makes me more hopeful, especially when I see how far we've come and don't just focus on how far we have to go. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a little more complex question. Uh, every movement, you've been involved a lot uh, of different movement, historical movements in the past, um, you know, make some mistakes along the way and learn some things. Yeah. What things have you learned, mistakes did, you know, previous movements in the past, what have you learned from that should be adopted that we can learn and adapt for today's fights? Boy, what a terrific question. Are you University of Chicago grads or <laughs> our students? Uh, very good questions these have been. Um, I guess the first lesson of from mistakes, because obviously the, the big lesson I learned is that if we organize, we can change the world. And if we don't organize, we don't change the world. But the big lesson I learned from mistakes is that we make mistakes. Individually, we make mistakes. As groups, we make mistakes. We make bad judgments. We sometimes do things that aren't worthy of ourselves. We sometimes do things that we are sad about. We wish we hadn't done. We wish the movement hadn't done. But to know that making mistakes is part of the learning and therefore to treat each other gently and with dignity and respect, even internally, even when we make mistakes, to learn about them. And I indicated we need to identify when there are differences, when there are mistakes, when there are uh, inadequate approaches to say, look, this is ineffective. Let's discuss what it really needs to be. Um, so that's one lesson. Uh, as opposed to pouncing on each other and saying, well, you made a mistake. What are you good for? Uh, in fact, you know, I, I sometimes think when you're in an organization and someone, let's say, said they would make five phone calls and they only made one, rather than saying, well, what the hell did you do that for? Why, why didn't you do what you said? You know, saying, how come you didn't make more calls? Maybe the answer was, my mother died. I haven't been well. I don't know how to do it. Then we need to train them. I don't want to do it because I don't believe in what we're doing. Well, then we have to re refigure what are we doing? Is Are we on the wrong track? So asking people um, and using the mistakes as a learning point is very important. Some other mistakes, though, uh, one I do think is this uh, dogmatism or absolutism. I do believe we stay firm on our values and our vision, but we are gentle with each other and not believing there is only one right way. It may be that we only want one approach, but there may be other ways that achieve effective ends also. Um, I think being and being too harsh on each other, uh, when the movement itself there was an article called Trashing, uh, written by Joe Freeman in the early women's movement, that's about how the movement itself can be unkind to people. I think that that's a big mistake. There always are questions about how fast do you settle and how fast do you uh, hold out. And those are always questions. And mostly, I think we need to say, what is it that allows the group to hold together? Is it self-important when you're making those kinds of judgments? So those are some of the uh, lessons I've learned. And again, if the person who raised the question wanted to share a lesson um, or a mistake that they're struggling with or that they think is common, uh, I'd welcome you to share it with the group now, too. 
Uh, similar to what you said, the, the response we're getting from that question is, uh, you know, how to deal with dogmatism, absolutism, and dealing with information in the age, you know, where we use the term fake news. Yeah. Um, on the first two parts of it, one of the things I try to do when I go into an organization or start with an organizing campaign is to not only be extremely explicit about what are our goals, what do we want to achieve, long-term, mid-term, short-term, what kinds of goals. Yes, we want freedom and justice, and that's important. We put that down, the values, we start everything from our values. But then what do we really want to win? Uh, one example in the marriage equality fight, we had agreed that we wanted, we were, we were organized to fight for marriage equality. There were many different kinds of groups that were part of it though, many different kinds. And at one key point, another issue came up that mattered to the LGBTQ community. And uh, when the issue came up, the, we raised to the group as a question, do you want to take on this issue? And a number said, if you take on this issue, I can't be part of it anymore. We have to just focus on marriage equality, otherwise for different reasons. You'll compete with my organization, our organization hasn't taken a position on it, just different issues. So we, we just clarified and were explicit about what we were organized for. A second element that I find helps the organization move forward is to create norms, N-O-R-M-S, norms of how we will operate. And it can be anything when we're having a group discussion, a step forward, step back. If you're talking too much, talk less. If you're not talking enough, we encourage you to talk. Uh, how often are you on your cell phone? Do we have no phones or screens in the group? Do we say go out for calls? Uh, do we... Um, say that everyone will be listened to, everyone will have a time. So you set your standards of internal behavior. And if people are violating those standards, we remind people about the standards and then can talk with them and also can say, do you want to change the standards? Do we want to function differently? But at least let's have rules of our internal operating and respect them. I also think that Respecting all people means that there are, you respect people's time. Meetings start on time and end on time. Not often done, but I'm really for it, especially in campaigns. You know, election day is one day. We can't say it's going to be later. So you start on time, you end on time. And for having a clear agenda, people know what they're coming to not only discuss, but decide on in advance. You do pre-organizing so that people are prepared coming into an organizational event to know what they will be asked to discuss and that they see their own names on the agenda to know they are going to be asked to speak to something. It's another way to build leadership so it's not just the same old people saying the same old things but constantly bringing in new people. And those who do the work should get that recognition. I mean, those are some, some hints for ways to deal with um, uh, these kinds of disagreements uh, that often develop in organizations. Thank you. Those are some excellent concrete examples. Uh, in, in honor of uh, keeping true to the time, we have one last question until we close out uh, for today. But can you uh, provide us, you've already given us some wonderful resources for jobs and progressive uh, causes, but some either books or thought leaders that you look to for uh, these uh, guidance on social change issues? Uh, yes, a great question. Actually, there are lists of uh, organizer books. Um, I'm trying to remember where they're posted, uh, but they're on some websites I've seen that are, uh, there are lots of manuals and books about organizing and films about organizing. Uh, a manual on organizing is that Organizing for Social Change I mentioned before from Midwest Academy. Uh, you can usually get it in a progressive bookstore, but I actually ordered them from Amazon, which I guess is selling everything these days. Um, 
there are many books about organizing. Uh, I just read the Van Jones book uh, that talks about the importance of talking to all people and listening to all people. Uh, I found he had a lot of insights. Um, there are uh, films. Uh, there's actually, I mentioned this one film, She's Beautiful When She's Angry. Um, there's a film called Salt of the Earth, which itself, the story of the making of the film is pretty amazing, but it's a story of a true strike, a minor strike that happened in uh, Western states uh, in the 50s, I believe, 1950s. Um, and in the story, it also conveys the tensions and the coming together between men and women involved in the families on strike, between organizers and members, between whites and uh, Mexican Americans, who are the majority of the uh, minors, um, between management and labor. Uh, and there are just many good lessons in that one film. There's a film about my life called Heather Booth, Changing the World. And there's a website, Heather Booth, the film, and you might go to it, there's a trailer for the film. And actually, I think there are people at the university who are going to bring it to the campus at some point. Uh, I think Jeffrey Stone in the uh, law school said that he might try to bring it to the campus. Um, but it's about my life in organizing and many of these lessons uh, conveyed through it. And then, of course, there are many wonderful leaders. I mentioned Elizabeth Warren. I think she's uh, quite a dynamic leader, but there's so many. Um, I also find inspiration from, from local leaders, uh, names you wouldn't know, Carmen Berkeley. Um, Gloria Gonzalez, I mean, other people whose names are not prominent, but who've played very important roles. If that was the last question, maybe in the last, do we have five minutes left? Yes, we have five minutes left. Okay. Um, then I wanted to share with you a poem by Marge Piercy called The Low Road. And I think it's a poem about organizing. This is part of the poem. What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can do anything you can't blame them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone you can fight, you can refuse, you can take what revenge you have, but they roll over you. But two people fighting back to back can cut through a mob. A snake dancing file can break a cordon. An army can meet an army. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall, a thousand of solidarity in your own newsletter, 10,000 power and your own paper, a hundred thousand your own media, 10 million your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. It starts when you say we and you know who you mean and each day you mean one more. I thank you for your interest in organizing and campaign work as a career. Um, though my time is limited, especially now with the tax fight, if you had a question about the career to follow up, I'll give you my email. Again, I, if my time is very limited right now. I hope it will open up when this fight is done. But my email is hbothgo at aol.com. And I would say I've tried many other careers. None have been as satisfying 
used all the skills and tools, everything I learned in college and more. And none made me feel that I was, in fact, leaving this a better world and knowing that if we organize, we can change the world. I hope you join into this work, experiment with it, try it on, continue with it, and I look forward to celebrating many victories with you together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you everyone for attending. This recording will be available. Uh, so thank you and tune in for the rest of Career Month offerings. Have a great day.